Hi, everyone. It's Jeremy Bourne. I'm Gray Matters Brand Manager. Thanks for logging in today for today's webinar. Are you running a smart building or just a connected building? As we're going to learn today, there's a big difference between the two, and we're going to talk all about it with Tom Walker, who is um, a, a new hire at Gray Matter. He joined us back in August, and like most of us, Tom developed his interest and expertise in IT on a destroyer-class U.S. Navy ship, and from there, uh, he went on to build some uh, secure networking infrastructure for a real estate company and did some consulting after that. And then we're going to get deep into this. He worked at Penn State where he supervised a team uh, working on facility automation services and worked together with Gray Matter, in fact, um, to build a very cool and very sophisticated uh, backnet network system that really spreads across all of Penn State's campuses, hundreds of buildings, secures them, ties them together, and um, makes possible a lot of that cool smart building technology that we're seeing a lot more of. Uh, just as a reminder to folks who might be new to the GoToWebinar platform, if you uh, look at your little control box, you'll see a tab that says questions. I highly encourage you to use it. Um, go ahead and just Type your question in there at any point during the presentation, and I will jump in if it's on a topic that Tom's discussing that we're, we're talking about at a particular moment. I'll jump in with the question. Um, if it's something that maybe can wait toward the end, I'll, I'll hold it for then when we'll have a, um, a designated Q&A period. But, but go ahead and, and ask those questions. Just type them into the box, and I'll make sure... Uh, to ask them of Tom. We really encourage participation. It makes it a more valuable experience for everyone. And we know that a lot of people are dealing with the same issues that, you know, we're probably working on right now, or that, you know, if you're working at a university, for example, um, you know, it's probably something Tom's contended with at, or is contending with at the moment. And so, you know, we'll be able to dig into your questions. So, so please do remember to do that. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, Tom, thanks for being on the call today. Welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, Tom, you want to you want to just start us off by just telling us a little bit about your background. I, I teased through a little bit, and then uh, you know we can get into it. Yeah, uh, this uh, kind of a uh, it's been over a long period of time. Uh, I've worked with some different types of control systems in the military. Um, and got brought over into kind of the start of a IT group in the U.S. Navy. Um, they didn't have a specific rate for it, so they were looking for people to volunteer and learn the systems. And so I joined that team, ran fiber all throughout the ship, and uh, began learning about the different computer systems. Um, and over the years, I kind of stuck with the IT when I got out and uh, focused primarily around the networking side, but still learned all the other aspects to how the different systems tie in and use that network. And um, and that's what kind of led me to Penn State at the time. Um, they were looking for an IT person to come in and look at the application uh, for their builder automation network and figure out the best method to uh, moving that network infrastructure forward. And so I joined the team in 2013 and uh, spent uh, roughly five years rebuilding the infrastructure and setting them on a path. Um, and out of that, during that time, I've also learned a significant amount about cybersecurity and securing those systems. And so that led me to a job opportunity with Gray Matter and um, I've been working with them for now just a little over a month and um, continue to learn and grow uh, as I experience new networks and new systems. So we're here today to talk about, you know, what is a smart building or a smart campus? And I, I spent several <laughs> several hours kind of just digging into all these different websites and looking, trying to find somebody, if somebody has a definition out there and there's, there's numerous different starts of it or pieces of it, but there doesn't really seem to be a, 
a cohesive definition of what that is. Um, and, and as you start digging further into it, you you see a lot of this marketing material based around these terms. And, and that's kind of what I discovered. It's it's much like all the other things that come out. You know, we have next gen firewall, big data, edge computing, micro data centers, IoT, IoT. I even heard uh, BIoT uh, for building uh, Internet of Things. Um, it's just a lot of buzzwords and hype around it. But you know, they want to sell you a widget that says, "Oh, this this makes you now have a smart building," or "This is going to give you edge computing." And a lot of times, there isn't just a single solution that's going to create that for you. Um, so over the years uh, working at Penn State, we had a lot of connected buildings. And to me, a connected building is just when it's there, it's for remote access or remote management, um, but it's not necessarily a smart building. So you have multiple different systems all connected in. And, you know, as you build this out, they're connecting a building gives you the opportunity to do a lot more things with it. Um, but there's also some issues that it can create. And as you start putting the pieces together and they start talking now, you got to start thinking about all the other aspects of that, which is, you know, the, the security, the topology, the design, Firewall rules, being able to do the cybersecurity, resiliency, reliability, and then remote access. Um, how do you want to manage these different entities that need to come in and talk to your connected building? And um, we had several conversations with a lot of different uh, vendors that, you know, oh, we'll just shoot the data up to the cloud. Um, well, how do you get that to the cloud? You know, what do you need to put on my network to talk to the cloud and pull that data? And I, I can't, I couldn't tell you how many times I heard, oh, we'll just put a JSON on there. Uh, okay, so you're going to put a JSON on here for this. Somebody else wants to put a JSON on here for some other widget that I'm trying to be sold. Um, you know, there, you start seeing these overlapping things and you want to look for ways to consolidate that. Uh, one of the big issues we saw um, as we started connecting things together was we had seven different systems trying to access a single steam plant server and the OPC driver was constantly just crashing and resetting itself. And um, so you gotta be cautious as you move forward and start connecting your buildings so you can, can start bringing them back and start adding the, the, the smart capabilities to them. Um, and even just independent smart systems doesn't make it a smart building. You, you know, you can have a smart building, a building automation system and then a dumb lighting system, or you can have a smart lighting system and a dumb building automation system. Um, those together independent systems don't make it a full smart building. And then you got to consider your stakeholders. Um, you know, what key technologies are they looking for? Um, as far as like end users, end users and are your retail tenants, re retail shoppers, students, you know, they're looking for Wi Fi, marketing, foot traffic, shopper analytics, smart parking, real time coupons, wayfinding, interactive displays. Um, you know, students now are looking for Wi-Fi, high-speed internet, comfort, privacy. Um, so those are things you have to kind of de design your building and your building systems around to meet their needs. But they're not the only people that you have to look at. You have to also look at it, your building operators, your management, your building owners. You know, the building operators are looking for automated controls for your lighting, parking, heating, cooling. Uh, access control, elevators, cameras, um, building managements are looking strictly for tenant retention. You know, what services can they offer that helps retain those tenants? Um, and the building owners are 
just looking for that ROI and income and also that long-term uh, savings that they can get from either energy management um, and those type of tool sets. <clears throat> and, and, you know, I, I, th this one I thought was pretty funny is, is, you know, even students today are asking, you know, is there an app for that? Can they have an app on their phone that allows them to manage their room or um, a lot of it's uh, your your focus is around you know trying to take uh, control of your environment and they're always looking for that next piece when they're trying to decide do I want to go to this university are they offering all the same things that the next university is offering so our definition of a smart building is independent smart systems which communicate and adapt while interconnecting in changing conditions to meet stakeholder objectives and goals. And the way you accomplish this is being able to take all these individual smart systems and start allowing to them to share information between each other. And it all comes around a, a, a central ecosystem. So you you take all the different utilities, you're taking all the uh, building data from the building automation system, all the lighting information. Uh, this also includes pulling in Wi-Fi data for you know, uh, being able to capture how many people are moving in and out. Um, you know, taking all these pieces of information and being able to share them with each other and show correlations on certain events. Um, especially when you're looking around like asset maintenance, you want to be able to better understand, all right, why is this system breaking down all the time? Well, you start analyzing the data and look, well, this started like two, two years ago when something changed on the system and now we're seeing the repercussions of that change. Um, having that long-term data and being able to analyze it and look for patterns and issues uh, really helps you get to that smart building system because it can adapt to any kind of changes that happen. Um, all of a sudden a storm comes in and changes the lighting uh, outside. Now you can increase the lighting on the inside. Um, different shading systems that you know can automatically shade based on sun's position, but also uh, adapting the cooling system to help cool better when that particular wall is sun facing and now you need to cool that space and maintain a temperature. Um, but without those systems being linked together, you're not truly going to get the sense of the picture of what is happening. Um, and, and that's where we started getting to at Penn State, being able to start pulling all these pieces together and, and allow them to interact with each other. Um, Hey, Tom, I, Tom, quick question. Yeah. Um, so, you know, once you have some of those components, you know, working together, maybe diagnosing an issue, is there an opportunity to, to use that to, to predict something going wrong or even for the system to do something about it? Yes, yes. Um, one of the things we started working with, uh, the elevators, on Penn State's campus, uh, we used an integration component that we were able to read in the uh, trouble status of the elevator via Modbus into a Node-RED collector that then issued a work order through our Maximo system. So it allows you to start allowing the system to tell you when there's an issue versus you're getting that call from the tenant saying uh, that, the elevator's now broke. And, it, and a lot of people have seen that commercial um, on the internet. Uh, they had where the elevator maintenance guy comes in and says, hey, I'm here to fix this elevator. And they say, well, it's not broke yet. Yeah, but it's going to be. <laughs> you know, it's getting to that, being able to be very proactive or even predictive in maintenance and troubleshooting um, getting that data sooner than just waiting for that call from the end user. That's a great example. Thank you. 
so when I started at Penn State, um, like I said, I was hired on to bring an IT perspective to the building automation system. Um, when I began looking at it, we it was just a big flat layer two infrastructure. We had buildings dropping off all the time. We had alarm saturation. Um, little did we know how bad the alarm saturation was. Um, one of the things that came from the overall being able to start collecting analytics and being able to drive metrics, we came out to find out that there were over 105,000 alarms per week uh, coming into the operations center. And it is physically impossible for somebody to get through all those alarms and truly hit the ones that are uh, are, that need a root cause analysis and something looked at um, and done about. Um, you know, it, it, they it just, everything seemed to be very overloaded. Um, so one of the first things I did is just kind of studied the network infrastructure, looked at the, the topology to get a better understanding of what I was seeing. And then um, I began talking with the other teams and one of my big things was I needed to understand what common languages do they want to use in this new next-gen network infrastructure. Um, they had already standardized on BACnet for the most part, um, but I wanted to make sure there weren't any other new ones that people were using or anything. And so we came down with our, our set of common protocols is BACnet, Modbus, and OPC. And we wanted to try to stick with those as much as possible. Um, so that it was easy to build this infrastructure and we knew it was going to work repeatedly for no matter what building we put it in or how we build it out. Um, as I started doing some research, I found we were set up in your standard BACnet BBM de BBMD deployment with every BBMD had everybody else in it. And so every network was hearing every single device, uh, one single blank who is on the network basically had uh, tens of thousands of devices responding back uh, with IM. Um, and it wasn't until I came across a uh, article published in the ASHRAE Journal from November 2007. Um, uh, it was uh, BACnet at Cornell by Michael Newman. And he referenced in it something called Split Horizon. And I started understanding the communication protocol and and understanding what the concept was. And I was like, wow, this is exactly what we need to do here at Penn State. And so from that began my rebuild of the whole building automation infrastructure and network. And so around 2014, I started the redesign. We started putting all the pieces together. Um, we first started with the network infrastructure itself getting rid of the big flat layer two daisy chains all across campus was one of the big pieces if we're going to be able to do analytics and collecting data and doing all these future things i needed to make sure that we were set to be able to do that and so at the core we did the data center network infrastructure um, then started building out from there around to the buildings and we did more or less a hub and spoke, but in a redundant way that um, basically 50% of the network could be offline and we could still stay functioning. Um, buildings could route through other buildings as needed. It was built on a layer three uh, OSPF network infrastructure. And now this is a separate network from the rest of the university. Um, and so we built it around that architecture. And once I got the network started moving and started getting it cleaned up and things, then I had to look at the data center infrastructure and you know how, how are we gonna manage the systems? We wanted to be 100% virtualized. We were pretty much there. There were a couple of systems we still needed to migrate. So we completely virtualized everything, got new hosts, got new servers, everything built up. Um, then it was time to talk about, you know, backups, uh, disaster recovery, you know, how resilient are we going to need to be if there's an issue in the infrastructure? And so once all those 
core pieces got put together, then we started looking, all right, now we need to put the security on. When we started, it was just still fairly open infrastructure. And so we wanted the ease of connectivity, get everything segmented, start the split horizon, but we didn't think about the security yet. And we didn't want to overcomplicate the building design as we're doing that. And so we started researching all the different solutions out there. Um, and that's when we came across uh, with Gray Matter, the tempered network HIPS, which is doing the micro segmentation. And it opened up the possibilities for us because now we could really secure that north to south traffic from the building back to the data center. Um, but we still needed insight to people doing things on those building networks and do installing stuff. So we started looking at uh, some of the other solutions out there to, for monitoring. Um, we ended up deciding on CyberX, gave us enough information to understand what systems we're trying to connect to where and when new devices popped onto the network or infrastructure, we were alerted and brought to our attention. Um, so we've got the communication between the building and the data center secured. We got the building being secured by the monitoring application. Now we needed to move into the data center and stop any of the east to west in the data center. And uh, we used a product called Gardacore that gave us micro segmentation at the server level. Um, and it allowed us to tie things down. So when a Johnson Controls guy logs in, he's only getting to Johnson Control Systems. Uh, the ALC guy was logging in. He was only getting access to the ALC applications and buildings. Um, so after um, all when that, we were talking, when we were talking before, not to not to interrupt, but uh, you mentioned HIP switches, host identity protocol, and you you kind of talked about that as like a bit of a revelation. Could, could you expand on on why that was so critical? Yeah. Um, the the way we were trying trying to look at all the different ways to secure we we looked at you know do we throw firewalls in every single building do we start putting acls on all the routers do we start implementing nac uh network access control you know there's all these different pieces and as, as you start looking at them they become very overwhelming at scale and and, and that's what we saw when we started trying to test things and look at different ways to do it. It just, everything got complicated once you start going out to 50, 60, hundreds of buildings. It just didn't, nothing scaled very easily. And what the temper gave us, it was a quick, easy put in, create the trust relationships, and we were done. Um, with a single management interface, very quick to deploy. Um, uh, my team at Penn State was awesome, and they were able to install the the POC in a couple hours. We had it up and running, things talking to each other, um, without any help from Tempered or the SE yet. Uh, we just fired it up and started playing with it and got it up very quickly, got it online. And even when the SE came out on site, he goes, well, I guess you've already done everything. There's nothing for me to do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it just was, it was such a very simple concept and so easily implemented that it, it was the right answer for us at that time. And it, it, it we've changed kind of our topology around how we're doing it. Um, and had started actually moving into the next evolution of it um, where we're putting in our own appliance at the edge with the tempered hip, the cyber uh, uh some data collecting and all those in a single appliance out at the edge, securing the building and collecting the data we needed, collecting it once and then sharing it up to wherever we needed it to go. And so all of these pieces and parts as we built this got us to the point to where now we can start talking about your data lake and your analytics and all those different things. Um, 
fault diagnostics and that predictive or even prescriptive maintenance. Because if you don't have that good foundation, that good infrastructure for it, um, if you've got building systems constantly going offline, the data you're collecting is garbage, garbage in, garbage out. You know, it's, it's a very basic concept. And we saw it with several buildings. We had one building that uh, they were using for research and they had the system, it was pulling a thousand devices every few seconds. And the building system couldn't even operate. They couldn't even function because it was trying to answer to the analytics collector. Um, so, and that started us down, you know, how, what it, how do we collect the data and be able to start doing all the fun stuff, the analytics and FDD and uh, prescriptive maintenance. And that's when we came up with the data lake concept. And so with the data lake concept, we want to collect it once and then share it to all the different systems that want access. And, and I had professors asking me for data, even students asking me for data. For, hey, I'm doing my project on this and I want to have all the data for this building for the last five years. And my answer to him was pretty much, I can give you the last 90 days, and that's about it. And uh, even at that, I can give it to you in an Excel sheet, which may not be easy for you to put into whatever system you want to look at it. Um, and so that, that struck a lot of conversation around how do we give them the data without giving them direct access to the building automation systems and all those different pieces. And so we started researching data lake concept and uh, we partnered with a company called Onboard Data that were able to do that for us. They are basically reading in the building data, bringing it into their system. They can tag it, contextualize it, and put friendly name and machine names to it so that we can tap on any type of analytics or whatever and we even uh you know for building engineers professors students we could give them access to the data lake and they can export whatever data they want from there but they don't actually get access to the building control systems which was a huge win for us for the security side that's not having to worry about all right we let this student in for this five week project and then we got to remember to make sure we cut off his access after that period of time. Um, so it, it, it really takes it to that next step. And some of our future thinking around that was, all right, so now that we have the data in the data lake, we run it through your analytics, your machine learning, and that machine learning could spit back out information to tell the you or the system that something needs to happen. Um, you can even get to the, the point where it actually does the, some of the basic troubleshooting. Um, we were talking about being able to feed the data in uh, on valve positions so that when it sees that there's uh, issue maintaining temperature in a particular room, it could open the valve all the way up, check for a difference, close the valve all the way shut, look for a difference. If there isn't, then we got a stuck valve. And so that would be able to, that machine learning would be able to say to the maximum order, order management system that, hey, we need you to go look at valve 25 on this system because it appears to be stuck. Or even just give you a list of a couple items of, it could be a stuck valve, a broken pipe, or you know whatever. There would be some steps for the person to troubleshoot a little further, but some of that basic troubleshooting has already been done for them. They don't have to bring their laptop out, hook it up, open up the valve, you know, and check all that information. It just kind of did some of that automatically for them. Um, so that was kind of where we're, we weren't quite there yet before I left, um, but we were on the road to be able to start doing some of those things because we built that connected infrastructure, secured, got everything in place. And so now that allows us to do all these great things with this building information. Tom, um, could you talk a little bit about the 
you know, return on investment that if a facilities manager is looking to, you know, down the, go down the road of trying to find efficiencies, uh, what kind of what kind of ROI can they expect? And just a reminder to folks on um, there is a tab to uh, post your questions on GoToWebinar, and if you put them in, um, I'll uh, relay them to Tom. So, Tom, what about ROI? So, um, one of the big things. Um, it's sometimes hard to get that ROI or at least measure it. How, how do you measure it? And, and uh, it really depends on how you're collecting your analytics data or collecting your uh, metrics. Um, you know, a lot of times they're in disparate systems and you're, you're trying to pull all this data together to, to figure that out. Um, so uh, one of the examples, um, uh, we implemented a system uh, uh, called uh, Events to HAC. What it allowed us to do was to be able to look at scheduling systems. So the university has their core uh, 25 live scheduling system. They're scheduling these buildings. Um, so why not control the rooms based off that scheduling? And so a couple of the guys on the uh, in the facility automation services group, put together a plan, implemented the software. Um, well, originally they looked at what available are, or what would it take to build our own system to do that. And as they started doing research, they found Events to HAC who already did that and has done it for a couple of years. So we're like, all right, well, let's try their software it's definitely going to be cheaper than us having to build it from the ground up. And so we took the data from 25 Live, read it into events to HVAC, and then pushed building schedules down to, um, I, think, I think the start was, was like 100 some odd classrooms at start. Um, and we're strictly doing it around just classrooms right now um, and general purposes rooms. And so they, read the information in, created the schedule, pushed it down to the controllers via the building control system. And instantly we started seeing uh, significant savings it, and just from the, the proof of concept. And uh, one of the pieces of it was, is we actually implemented it without telling anybody. And, and we got a lot of feedback when we started proposing this to the building engineers and stuff. Uh, we got a lot of kickback from them saying, oh, well, you're not going to do that in my spaces and all this stuff. And we're like, well, we already did, kind of. And so uh, it was an interesting discussion um, because they didn't realize that we had already done it and there weren't any complaints. Um, or if, if there were, it was very few, because usually what it was is the ad hoc people that go into a space that wasn't planned for occupancy at that particular time. And if that room didn't have an occupancy sensor, then uh, it is, and sometimes some of those systems would take a period of time before they cool down anyway. So, um, but the overall feedback was that it was doing a really good job. And so we moved forward with the project implemented in roughly 400 plus buildings or 400 plus rooms and very quickly we were seeing 60 to 70 percent of the rooms are unoccupied um, when you start running these reports and some of these rooms were set to run from 7 a.m to 11 p.m every day um, and so by cutting back that um, it just instant huge savings enough that we actually paid for the software in two months just from the savings and in those couple rooms um, and one of the nice things was is it actually gave us some feedback data we created some events and alarms around it that we started seeing all right what building spaces do we have really good control over and ones that we don't um, you know, some of the rooms were taking up to 30 minutes to get the temperature, and then others were like less than five minutes. Um, so it, it, we were able to start tracking that data 
and comparing it to the scheduling and all the different pieces. And so now we are able to show that energy savings um, just from that one little project. Um, and I mentioned the other one, uh, the maintenance on the elevators. That collecting that data really helped the maintenance supervisors for the elevators start predicting elevator failures. Um, one of their biggest issues was student move in, student move out. Um, he was able to start collecting information based on its usage during that, those days. And we found elevators anywhere from 1,900 trips to over 2,400 trips in one day of that elevator going up and down. And uh, he was able to collect, you know, how, how quickly was the elevator responding? You know, it was a 30 second wait time and, you know, all these different things. He was able to collect those metrics now and be able to show um, the elevators that are showing signs of age. And, and we found one that was pretty significant. It, it was constantly breaking down, couldn't figure out what it was. Well, it was one of those ones that was constantly being used during that student move in and move out that uh, it just, it wasn't handling that, uh, that usage. Tom, we have a, a couple of questions um, that I think, you know, relate to some things that we uh, touched on earlier in the presentation. But uh, one of the questions is, um, are all of the building data points monitored and controlled by the local building PLCs? Are those data points available for access, you know, uh, with the new central system? Uh, yes, uh, and everything, uh, because we chose BACnet, we had everything exposed from the building up into the infrastructure. Um, the way we started collecting the data up to onboard data was using uh, the Department of Energy built a product several years ago called Voltron. Um, it's an open source project uh, funded by them. It uh, wasn't very well implemented. Uh, not a ton of people use it. Um, but in partnering with Onboard Data, they had made a, the suggestion of using that product to collect the data at the billing level and bring that up to them. And so that's how we're implementing those buildings. We're reading the points in via BACnet into the Voltron appliance, and then that data is shipped directly up to the cloud from the building. It doesn't even go to the data center. Um, it just, it's being shipped directly out to, to the internet from the building. Gotcha, thanks for that. Um, now we have kind of like a, a two to three part question, so, so bear with me, but, uh, did you give a name of the software that allowed for the self troubleshooting? Uh, no, uh, we we had looked at uh, several different uh, pieces of software that have that capability. Uh, and I'd be able, for the life of me, I'm I can't remember them. All that we looked at. Um, a good person would, to talk to would be Tim Pryor. Uh, who is the manager of the Facility Automation Services Group. Um, he and I kind of tag team that and uh, we're looking at different uh, products that uh, can do that or that have those capabilities. Um, I know here this fall, now that we're collecting data on roughly 10, and that was one of the things with the uh, onboard data, collecting the data points, um, we're collecting all data points. Uh, in some systems um, that we dealt with in the past for analytics, they're only collecting metering data, uh, your, you know, your power usage, your flows, and you know, some of the basic data, of, you know, maybe a handful of points per building. Um, with the onboard data, we're actually collecting all 1,100 points in one of the buildings um, because we found that even though you may not use all of that data, there's definitely some tidbits in there that can be helpful. Um, you know, we, we've gotten asked uh, several times for, you know, can you give me the average runtime of fans across the campus? And we have no way to collect or show that data. Um, without this now, with the onboard data, we have that capability. I can run a report across multiple buildings, across the whole portfolio and say, 
all right, the average runtime is 30 minutes with the max of this and the minimum of that. Um, we can actually definitively give those answers because we're collecting all the pieces and parts. Cool, thanks. Tom, can you talk about where is the data analytics actually done or performed? We fought, <laughs> we fought with this decision uh, back and forth. You know, do we do we house it internally? Do we let it be in the cloud? Uh, one of the biggest issues is is just the sheer volume of data that's coming from these systems. Um, even at my 90 days of of data kept on each of the buildings, uh, we were sitting at over 100 ter terabytes of data. Um, that the the IT team was trying to manage. Um, so why not let the cloud people who have the cheaper store, cheap and deep storage and and all the compute power, let them do all that heavy lifting instead of us trying to build out that infrastructure internally to handle all that. And so we started looking, opening it up to cloud solutions. Um, I know uh, the team is going to be doing a POC or actually a, a, a R, R, a RFI for a POV uh, late this fall that will be giving all the analytics vendors an opportunity. And the big caveat is they have to be able to pull the data from onboard data. They have to be able to either interact with their API or we have a way that we would need to push the data from the onboard data over into the API of the analytics software. But the, that interconnection is kind of one of the core requirements because we just want to collect that data. Again, like I said, collect it once, share it a thousand times if we have to. Um, because one of the other pieces we came across was who owns the data? Um, with some of the analytics packages, they, as part of their agreement, is they get to keep your data, which um, didn't really sit well with us. So we wanted to be able to have our data no matter what. And that's what the data lake gives us is that continuous constant. So, if, you know, this week we're using uh, this particular product and then uh, five months later we decide, all right, it, not quite doing everything that we want, but this one does, so let's switch to it. Now I can still import all the past history, historical data into that new system and be able to run the same reports and whatever other bells and whistles that that software does. And you got to keep control of your own data. Yep. That's, that sounds like a key thing. So Tom, thanks so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Um, we're going to follow up with everybody who joined us today on the webinar. We'll send out an email um, with a recap of today's session, a recording of it, and also ways to contact us if you want to get into a deeper conversation with Tom or another cybersecurity lead, Scott Christensen. Um, Tom, I'm sure you can also facilitate if we want to have a discussion with uh, Tim from Penn State to share more about his experience and some of the questions that we got asked today. But um, Tom, thanks so much for the time today.